You are listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's December 11th. There were several key milestones this week on the journey toward a widely available, safe, and effective COVID-19 vaccine. On Tuesday, the world's first COVID-19 vaccinations, made by Pfizer and BioNTech, were administered in Great Britain. On Wednesday, Canada approved the same vaccine. And yesterday, the FDA's vaccine advisory panel voted in favor of emergency authorization of the Pfizer vaccine for use on people 16 and older. This vote clears a key hurdle before the FDA will provide authorization, which is expected to come within days. As more and more countries prepare for and begin large-scale manufacturing and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, global coordination will be key. But according to a study by RAND Europe, previous pandemics show that national governments may follow their own perceived interests instead of pursuing a more globally coordinated approach. This behavior, called vaccine nationalism, includes countries pushing to get first access to a supply of vaccines or hoarding key components of vaccine production. If it happens this time, and in fact there are reports that wealthy nations may already be hoarding vaccines, it could cost the global economy up to $1.2 trillion per year in GDP. Why the massive price tag? Countries will incur economic penalties for the global population, and for themselves if they initially immunize only their own citizens. And as long as the virus is not under control in all regions of the world, there will continue to be a global cost associated with COVID-19. The findings show just how important equal access to the vaccine is, not only from a public health perspective, but also an economic one. Here's some math that really drives this point home. For every $1 spent on supplying vaccines to lower-income countries, high-income countries would get about $4.80 in return. The U.S. is living through an era of truth decay. More and more Americans disagree about basic facts. This has dire consequences, such as the erosion of public trust, deepening polarization, and a lack of civil discourse. And if Americans can't agree on facts, then they'll be hamstrung in efforts to address today's most complex problems, including pandemics and climate change. Civic education may be key to reversing course, but according to a new RAND survey of school principals and social studies teachers, educators need more support to foster children's civic development. Based on the survey results and previous research findings, RAND experts offer some recommendations to help teachers overcome some of the barriers they face in focusing on civics in their classrooms. Here are four of those recommendations. First, think outside the textbook. The survey results suggest that democratic simulations, like school-based elections and mock trials, are underused in public schools. These hands-on experiences could be an effective way to engage students and help them learn about democracy. Second, incorporate civic education into other subjects. Many teachers said that the pressure to cover other subjects was a barrier to teaching civics. But civics could be woven into those other subjects. For example, imagine a math class that helps students understand concepts such as margins of error in polling data or how congressional seats are apportioned. Third, embrace controversy. Understandably, many teachers avoid discussing controversial topics in their classrooms. But this is an area where teachers could tap into social and emotional learning practices to guide students through discussions of controversial topics in a safe and respectful way. This could help kids learn how to have healthy, constructive conversations about tough subjects, rather than avoid them. Fourth, and finally, help teachers deliver equitable and inclusive civic education. Overall, teachers need more support to promote student civic development, but this is especially true for teachers in schools that serve more students of color and low-income students. 
In particular, districts, schools, teachers, and parents could advocate for access to instructional materials that have been vetted for their accuracy and quality. These actions are central to reviving civic education in America's public schools, but they're just one part of the larger effort to rebuild our civic infrastructure, reverse truth decay, and restore the role of facts in public life. South Korean President Moon Jae-in appears eager to set a new tone for U.S.-South Korea relations. That's according to Rand's Soo Kim. Since Joe Biden was elected to be America's next president, Moon and his team have been busy issuing public statements and arranging high-level meetings with key players in the incoming administration. This proactive and enthusiastic attitude is encouraging, Kim says. It underscores the importance of the U.S.-South Korea alliance to Seoul's interests and strategic considerations. This shift in tone from Moon may also be favorable to addressing key foreign policy issues, such as competition with China, tensions between South Korea and Japan, and denuclearization talks with North Korea. But notably, Moon is running short on time as he enters the final year of his presidential term. This could create its own set of challenges in making progress on some of the long-standing policy issues that have been a source of irritation between the U.S. and South Korea. To maintain and expand its important operations in the Arctic and Antarctic, the U.S. Coast Guard requires vessels that can operate in heavy polar ice. Currently, only two ships, the Polar Star and the Healy, are capable of icebreaking. These ships are built for strength. The Polar Star, commissioned in 1976, is designed to break ice up to 21 feet thick. The Healy is a more modern ship, built in the late 90s, but it can break up to only 8 feet of ice. These icebreakers are used primarily for scientific research and polar resupply, but they also help the Coast Guard fulfill other responsibilities. Both the Polar Star and the Healy have limited time left in their operational lifespans, and so the Coast Guard is moving forward with plans to build a new icebreaker fleet. In a new paper, RAND researchers explore key considerations for this new fleet. They assess the needs for implementing additional icebreaking capacity, determine how to ensure that the new vessels are built with the changing polar environment in mind, and consider other complementary investments, including investing in Coast Guard personnel. In 2016, there were concerns that newly elected Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte would undermine or undo the U.S.-Philippines alliance in favor of closer ties with China. But this hasn't happened, says Rand's Derek Grossman. In fact, Manila has consistently prioritized Washington over Beijing. Duterte's siding with the U.S. has been an extremely frustrating trend for China. Beijing may even believe that it's blowing a monumental opportunity to get rid of the U.S.-Philippines alliance once and for all. So why is it that the Philippines is sticking by America's side? The bottom line, says Grossman, is that Duterte simply cannot trust China's growing assertiveness in the South China Sea. Quote, This is the precise challenge that has flummoxed Duterte's pro-China approach from the beginning of his tenure. And the obvious beneficiary of Manila's China suspicions is Washington. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered this week, check the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. Happy Hanukkah, and we'll see you next week.